Jim, I said, it's three times Stuart's done me already today. And he just looked at me and he went, not today, son, not today. The ball could be 50 yards away and Martin would be right up behind me, pinching me, deliberately standing on my toes with his studs. It just became a bum fight whenever he played against each other. He had their mad eyes that like the red mist comes down, you know, a bit like Franny Benali had. <laughs> and he, he had that, it was like, didn't want to didn't get too close to him. Hello, I'm Jeff Stelling. Welcome to Football's Greatest. Each week, I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince, and the moments that will stay with you for life. This week, I've been joined by one of the most skillful players ever to grace the game. In Southampton, they called him Le God. He is Matt Letissier, and he is going to discuss with me his five toughest opponents. Mm. And we are going back to the days, Matt, when, as a midfield player, very different to these days, I think, you must have got lumps kicked out of you. Yeah, there was, uh, there was definitely uh, a lot more had to be done for a yellow card to be issued back in, back in the day when I started. I mean, I remember my second ever game for Southampton. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I took my place on the right wing and I took a look down the left hand side of the opposition's defence and, and there was Stuart Pearce and I was like wow I was just saw these thighs on a bloke it was just like I've never seen thighs that big on a bloke before <laughs> uh, and then for the next 45 minutes he decided to kick the crap out of me basically as, a, as I was only a 17 year old kid I was about 10 and a half stone dripping wet at the time and I was thinking whoa this, this professional football is quite tough uh, and I don't think he even got a yellow card for it so, yeah, how, how was, do you think you'd have done then in these sort of less physical times I, I think I, I would have it would have been a lot easier to play I mean there certainly wouldn't have been the same levels of fear and intimidation that there were um, you know, knowing that players can't tackle you from behind, they're going to get carded straight away if it happens. So, you know, it would have been a lot easier to play as a as a ball player in this day and age. They don't know their but and and also, you know, we talk about it being a lot easier in terms of the the tackling and stuff. But what a lot of people don't talk about is how much easier it is to dribble on pitches that are like carpets. You know, we didn't have that. We didn't Was really the Dell not like that? The Dell wasn't really a carpet, yeah. no. <laughs> I mean, the only carpets really back in our day were probably Highbury um, mm -hmm. and Anfield sometimes. The rest of the pitches were, you know, come come kind of October, November, they'd started to cut up and, it'd be, and it, was not, it was not easy to dribble on those kind of pitches, certainly not in the winter. So if we're looking at the modern game then, is there, if you were playing now, is there anybody you wouldn't fancy playing against? Anybody who's a bit of a throwback, if you like, to your era? Oh... That's a good question, actually. I think I think most of the defenders are uh, kind of more more cultured these days, and uh, and, and they want to they want to you know play out from the back and all that kind of stuff. I think I'd actually really enjoy playing uh, today because the defenders now they give you a chance. They they give you a chance in really dangerous areas of the pitch where which never used to happen. You know, it was always safety first, and and a, and a lot of the players. I mean, you can maybe say. Lewis Dunk, perhaps uh, a little bit, a little bit more old school. Um, there isn't really those kind of players that had those kind of intimidation. You know, the the Roy Keynes, the Patrick Vieiras, the Jimmy Cases, who was who was my teammate, who I saw intimidate many a player. You know, Vinnie Jones tried it. Vinnie Jones tried it. How? Um, I, I say Vinnie Jones tried. I, I didn't really see Vinnie Jones as the hard man that everyone else kind of did to be honest um, I, I played against Vinny when he was playing against uh, Jimmy Case and honestly it was so funny to watch Vinny would just go nowhere near Jimmy you know it was almost like a, he had this respect thing for Jimmy going on and, and Vinny was completely intimidated by Jimmy Case so because I saw that I didn't really feel intimidated by Vinny Jones at all Say, it's one thing getting a grip on Paul Gascoigne, but another thing with Jimmy Case. Absolutely. Know your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> was, you, am I right in thinking your debut was against Spurs? It was. My full debut was full against Spurs. Full debut was against Spurs. Remember who was in that Spurs team? 
Uh, Graham Roberts was in that. Would have yeah. been in that, that Spurs uh, team. Razor Ruddock was in that Spurs team. Was he indeed? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Wow. So Glenn Hoddle was in that team as well, actually. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> Glenn wouldn't kick you, but the other two might have done. Absolutely, they would have. And um, also, I remember playing a couple of years after that against Spurs when they had. I was still playing on the right wing, and they had. Um, Pat Vanden Howe playing oh, the left right. back. Oh, he was a monster, wasn't oh. he? He had their mad eyes that, like, the red mist comes down, you know, a bit like Franny Benali had, <laughs> and he, he had that. It was like didn't want to didn't want to get too close to him. <laughs> the, the strange thing is, isn't it? Because you brought Franny in there now. The strange thing is, like, Franny off the pitch is the nicest man in the world. David Prutton, who we used to work with, off the pitch, nicest man in the world, yeah. on the pitch, you know, turns into an absolute <laughs> monster. Um, but you, I found actually that there was quite a common theme with, with all those kind of guys. You know, I mentioned playing against Stuart Pearce early on in my career. And for for a few years, he, he, he did frighten me. I was scared of him. <laughs> I don't mind admitting it. And then I got in the England squad and spent some time with him. And and I ended up I ended up playing in the card schools with him at England, and I thought he's a really nice bloke. And and strangely enough, after that, I didn't mind playing against him because I knew he was actually quite a nice bloke. And actually, that's just a bit of a front. That you he thought he probably on. wasn't going to hurt you too much. He, he kind of uh, later on in my and, and I kind of got a little bit. I bulked up a little bit, and and I was a bit stronger, uh, so I didn't mind having a bit of a physical battle then. We, we might come round to Stuart Pearce. He might figure in your top five. Um, who, who've got number five? I would say Stuart because that, that was my first one. Really, I came across that was, oh, that frightened me a little bit. You see, you had <laughs> some tough guys in your team at the time as well, didn't we? Mention Franny and Jimmy Case. We did. There. Well, that game. I mean, that that game in that first half when when Jimmy was. Jimmy was brilliant in our team because he was like our minder because we had a, quite a young forward line in those days. And so he would like kind of protect us from, from the other opposition. Normally, if somebody like give you a bit of a smack, he'd just take a note of their number and like a couple of minutes later, you'd see him smash him off the ball somewhere. And you could get away with it in those days because there was only one camera at the ground so he could do whatever he wanted. Um, but that, that particular game, I remember just jogging inside to him where he was, he was playing centre mid and just going... I said, uh, Jim, I said, it's three times Stuart's done me already today. And he just looked at me and he went, not today, son, not today. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that Stuart Pierce is quite hard, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, 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 he said, well, anybody who's got the nickname of Psycho, yeah. you're not going to look forward to playing against, are you? No, absolutely. And we had, we had actually a guy when I first got into the Sun team, similar, uh, same nickname, um, was a guy called Mark Dennis, who I'm sure you'll remember very well. Uh, who I was very pleased I was on the same side as him. Um, however, I did uh, a couple of seasons later, he left and went to join QPR and I played against him at QPR and that was a little bit scary as well. He had the longest metal studs in his boots of any player I've ever seen. Yeah, when um, Stuart Pearce says in his, his biography, he says, when he crossed the white line, he was always in control. Did it strike you that way? <laughs> I'd probably disagree with that on some occasions. Although, in fairness to him, Stuart was always very, I, I say fair, he would always try to take the ball as well as the man. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? He was very good at it. He didn't really kind of, he wasn't a, uh, like a sneaky, off-the-ball type uh, defender. Uh, who I'll come to in a minute with one of the other players that I mentioned in my list. Uh, he was kind of in your face and he, and he was hard and he was tough and he would go through you, but he would he would go for the ball as well. But he would think nothing of taking you out at the same time. Mm. I mean, a lot of the tackles that Stuart made back in the day, nowadays, when you see people getting off for winning the ball and then following through and getting the player, Stuart would have had quite a lot of red cards, I would say, for... For that that kind of thing, he was very good at getting both. Did you actually have a, a sort of grudging admiration for him, in a, a sense, because he'd come from a non-league? Oh, background, absolutely. He? Went on to captain his club, captain his country as well. Absolutely, I did. Um, you know, because you know he wasn't just a he wasn't just a hard bloke. He also was very good as a as an attacking fullback. You know, it was, there was some seasons he was scoring, you know, a phenomenal amount of goals. He just used to he had this thing where he would just drive forward. 
uh, and he'd knock the ball to Nigel Clough and he would just carry on running and Nigel Clough had the vision to, to be able to get the ball back to him um, and they had, a, they had a cracking partnership there so yeah I had a lot of admiration for Stuart as a, as a footballer definitely. of course you had something else in common with Stuart Pearce because like you he didn't go to the 1998 World Cup under Glenn Hoddle uh-huh, that's yeah. true yeah yeah. and uh, I, what I did have huge admiration for him for was the uh, the penalty against Spain in the Euros in 96 when you know he'd had the heartbreak of what happened in 1990 um, and I think the reaction when he scored that goal is just something that would is imprinted in most English football fans' minds. Well, the entire nation reacted the same way. Exactly they? right. We, you know, we did in front of the telly, and um, so yeah, a huge, huge respect for Stuart as a, as a man as well. And and again, you know, the last few years I've seen him a, a fair bit around. One of the nicest blokes you could meet. Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you, please, to hit that subscribe button? That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. OK, so Stuart Pearce, we've got at number five. What about number four? So I think uh, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with Paul McGrath okay. at, at number four because although Paul was a strong centre-back and could put his foot in, um, he was one of the best readers of the game. Uh, I think I played against. He was really, really difficult to get the better of. Um, found it quite, quite tough uh, to to get around him. He always seemed to be in the right place, and and it was just amazing because all the stories that you hear about Paul, you know, because of his knees couldn't train. For him to be able to play at the level that he did for so many years, but without actually having to train in between the matches was just... Well, you know how that feels. Well, yeah, <laughs> I did turn up for training. <laughs> but it was just incredible. Um, you know, I thought these stories were kind of uh, folklore, you know, myths made up about this this guy. But then I spoke to the, the guys that played with him at Aston Villa and, and they were just like, no, he just just didn't train. Couldn't train. His knees were knackered. And, but the levels that he performed to on a Saturday were just incredible. Um, so I was really... I had one moment against him where I kind of got the better of him and it's and it, because it, he was such a good player it's one that stands out uh, we're at, at Villa Park at the whole end I got the ball in the in the box and I went to shoot with my left foot and I could see him coming to block me so as he as he went to block me I just chopped it back and sent him for a pie and rolled it in the corner at the whole end and uh, so when you when you get the better of somebody that good it kind of sticks in your mind a little bit so you, yeah. you scored a few goals against Villa in fairness during his time so I did uh, but that was the only time really that he was I, I had to get past him to to go and do it really um, but yeah Villa there was three teams actually I, in my career where I got into double figures against yeah, in my career so Villa was one of them uh, Nottingham Forest was the other one and Spurs Mm-hmm. ironically which Ironic, was my yeah. team as a boy it's interesting isn't it that obviously we, we talk we joke about you know that you didn't like training and so on and so forth and, and Paul McGrath couldn't train so in some respects he must have been like you had to have a manager who understood that yes. yeah absolutely he did yeah um, and you know I think there would probably be a lot of managers who who would have dismissed him mm. and just gone sorry you can't train you know, I can't, I can't possibly do that to you. But his, his ability was just so out the norm that he had managers who were who were prepared to put up with that and and stick him in the team, you know, even at international level. Mm. Uh, it was just amazing. Yeah, what a player he was. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Pearce and Paul McGrath. It's a pretty good start, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Who's next, Tis? Um So I'm going to go for Gary Pallister next. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. People, uh, people might be surprised. I would be surprised yeah. by that because, you know, you're thinking of toughest opponents and, of course, Pallister and Bruce were, what, seven years together at Manchester United and I thought you would have said, Steve Bruce, you know, wipe you out. Yeah, but I, uh, for me, I, I actually... I, I actually felt like I had more of a chance against Steve Bruce than I did against Pally. Pally, uh, he was one of those players who just... You thought you'd got past him and that long leg would just come out from nowhere and he'd slide it round the side of you. And he was just like, how the hell has he got to that? Um, and he was just really frustrating to play against. Um, and again, a, a, somebody I got to know at, at England, um, in the England squads, and, and again, another another brilliant bloke. But he was a, he was a centre-back who could play, um, but also one that I, I just struggled to get the better of. Um, 
and and it was it was just those those long limbs. Every time you thought you just had half a yard on him, he'd just stick his leg out from somewhere and think, "How the hell have you got to that?" And he was pretty frustrating to play against. So yeah, I, I, I did struggle against Palace, and, and, and they complemented each other so much, Brilliant. didn't they? Bruce Brilliant and Palace, uh, what a match! Brilliant partnership and the success they had at that club while while those two were there was just was just phenomenal. I mean, you talk about players and you know England caps and things like that, and you know a lot of people when when you come to talk about players who never got an England cap and should have had one, Steve Bruce is yeah in that conversation quite a lot. Yeah, superb partnership. Um, of course, Gary Pallister played in that infamous. 6-3 Manchester United defeat at Southampton. Well, I say he played it, he played a half in it because he was taken off at, at half time. Mm. I'm sure it, it's one of the games that must stick in your memory because you scored a fantastic goal apart from anything else. Yeah, I mean, that day was just, I mean, it's, it's what people don't realise about that day. It doesn't get spoken about much about that day is that Roy Keane got sent off yeah. in that game quite early. So I think it was about twenty minutes. minutes like yeah, that. about twenty minutes. So, so we had we had seventy minutes to play against them, and they still scored three times against us. So that's how good they were. But yeah, that game was 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 brilliant. We had uh, Isle Berkovic in top form that day. Egil Oshinstad, who uh, controversially had his hat trick taken off of him. Uh, Did he really? The, the, I didn't know that. Yeah, the last goal was went down as an own, own goal. goal. Phil Neville own goal. I think he's still got the match ball though. He took he took the match ball on the day before they took the goal off of him. But yeah, that that was just a uh, one of those one of those days where you know the the whole team played to their potential. Yeah. I know. think it's it's generally thought of, isn't it, as possibly the most embarrassing Manchester United defeat of the the whole of that decade in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, and it and it came on the back of that five 0 defeat at, at St James's Park. So they conceded eleven goals in the space of you know, five or six days, which I don't think has probably ever happened in Man United's history before. So, yeah, that was a that was a pretty special day, that one. Yeah, and I would imagine that Pally was pleased to be off at half-time. I still <laughs> I see him quite a lot now. He looks like he could still play an actual back yeah. in a, But I, I didn't realise that he was taken off at half-time in that game, so the next time I see him, I'll definitely be asking him about <laughs> it. <laughs> you may have heard that NordVPN is an essential cybersecurity tool which protects all your personal data whilst online. But did you? know, it could save you money. With NordVPN, you can take advantage of cheaper pricing in other countries by switching your location with one click. For example, if you're going on holiday, you can book flights, hotels and rental cars via another region and take advantage of the cheaper prices in that region. NordVPN is the same price as a cup of coffee a month, but with these savings, NordVPN essentially pays for itself. To grab our huge discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com slash fgpod. This code will also give you four extra months on the two-year plan. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the episode description box. So who's next, Tiss? You've got two to come. Uh, so number two, uh, I'm going to go for Martin Keown. He was probably the most annoying defender that I played against you know you talk about players that were Stuart Pierce would be fair would go through you with the ball um, but you know wasn't one of those where it was off the ball Martin was horrible off the ball the ball could be 50 yards away and Martin would be right up behind me pinching me deliberately standing on my toes with his studs uh, and it was just it just became a bun fight whenever he played against the other because George Graham had this habit of putting a man marker on me whenever his teams played against me. So so Martin was one of those. I think he did it with when he was at Leeds, I think he did it with Chris Fairclough, I think. But but Martin was just they called him the rash for a reason. Yeah. And he was told to man mark me and honestly he literally f- would follow me, not be within a yard or two of me the whole match. Did you um did you talk to him during the course of a game? <laughs> um not really. Did, did you with any not, of these not guys? Not in terms of conversation. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, sometimes you'd have a conversation with people. Martin wasn't one of those blokes you could have a conversation with. I mean, if I spoke to him, it was just to abuse him, really, because he was being an idiot. And honestly, when we played against each other, we just both of us used to end up getting yellow cards because we'd just be fighting each other off when the ball was like 40 yards away and he's still elbowing me. 
fucking idiot. So I think, yeah, from from that point of view, he was he was the most annoying defender. I, and he, he's probably very proud of that fact, knowing Martin, yeah. uh, because he did like to get under people's skins. And so, yeah, I I didn't enjoy I didn't enjoy playing against Martin. And well, you did once. He'll love that. You did once oh. because it was the last game at the Dell. Well, yes. And Martin Keown was in that Arsenal team. He was indeed, but I'd only come on as a sub for like 12 minutes, so I didn't have to endure him for too long. And uh, and he wasn't man-to-man marking me. They probably thought I was that fat at that point. They didn't need to man-to-man mark me. <laughs> well, when you scored that winning goal, 89 minutes... You must have been tempted to go and say something to him. I didn't. It didn't even cross my mind, uh, to be honest with you. At that point, that was just such an amazing moment that the, the opposition didn't matter for me. There, I'd completely forgotten about Martin. I did score at at Highbury in a, in a game. I think we ended up losing four um, two, but I scored and, and kind of got the better of him a little bit. I I kind of got on his blind side a little bit and he kind of switched off for just a second and I managed to nip in front of him take a touch and smash it past David Seaman at, at Highbury so um, but they were few and far between the, the moments when I kind of got the better of Martin when he was marking me Six red cards in the, the Premier League for Martin Keogh and so it wasn't just you oh, that, no. that he was all <laughs> over was it but it's because he played with Tony Adams a lot of the time as well was was Martin Keogh more intimidating than Tony Adams then? He, he was actually um, in terms of kind of being uh, being a little bit a little bit scared uh, uh, because I knew that Martin was you know would think nothing of you know snapping you. Um, he, he had those he had those weird eyes that Pat Van Den had. He had the same ones. You could see he's, it in his he's eyes. He still got them. He still got yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, still got them. So yeah, I, I, Tony was was cracking. Don't get me wrong. Tony was a, a cracking defender. Um, and uh, and again, somebody I, I kind of got to know um, at England as well, and, and, and like Tony, so. Um, he wasn't. He, Tony wasn't quite as intimidating. He was. He was hard, uh, but he was kind of more in the Stuart Pearce mould as opposed to the Martin Keown mould. Well, a number of years ago, I met Martin Keown in um, an airport abroad, and we were both just returning from holiday. And we we got chatting about punditry, and I think he was just getting involved at the time. And he said the problem with some of today's pundits is they are too intense. He said, <laughs> staring me down, <laughs> and it was you know I can't believe anybody who was more intense as a player oh, or as a absolutely. pundit than Martin Keown. Well, it's nice to know that the the. the Shoe is on the other foot for a yeah. change, Martin. <laughs> yeah, but, but in, in, in fairness to him, we, we, you know, we talked about you know what people are like on the pitch and off the pitch. Again, I, I find him an incredibly likable, approachable guy off the pitch. Yeah, you know, yeah. as I, compared to on it. Yeah, yeah, and and most of the players. I mean, I don't really kind of. I mean, I spent seventeen years in the change room at Southampton. I could count on one hand the amount of people I didn't really get on with. Most most of the lads too. We're good lads, mm. good lads. Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you, please, to hit that subscribe button? That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. Uh, so we've had your 5432. What about number one? Who was your toughest opponent? My toughest opponent, um, and again, not a dirty opponent, but somebody I found very difficult to get the better of and, and because you will never beat Des Walker. Des for me uh, was a Rolls Royce of a defender. You know, he just read the game really well, um, but his pace just he covered the ground so quickly. Even if you kind of managed to get past him, he was back at you in the blink of an eye. And you know, a lot of the time, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't particularly quick, as you know. Uh, I did have a little bit of pace, and and but normally, if I I got the better of a defender, I I did I could get away from him. But I just found that Des was just always there. He just couldn't shake him off. I remember I remember one time he was playing for Sheffield Wednesday and uh, I was playing up front for, for Southampton that day. And I, um, Sheffield Wednesday had a corner and it was literally just me and Des left up the field. So Des was like on the halfway line. I was just kind of like a few yards in front of him. Uh, and so they took the corner and, and we cleared it and they cleared the ball and it's come straight to my... F- to my foot I've controlled it brilliantly I've turned and it's me against Des Walker one on one like I've got 50 yards behind him and I remember getting the ball and he come to engage me and I knocked the ball past him <laughs> right. and and he just turned around and literally honestly 
he didn't even get out of second gear and he got to the ball. And I just remember I was being in the middle of the pitch at, at Hillsborough and I just started laughing. And he and he started laughing because we both knew what was I thinking of? I've knocked the ball past Des Walker thinking that I can get to the <laughs> other side of it. And we both of us just started laughing in the middle of the pitch at Hillsborough. <laughs> and I just looked at him and went, what was I thinking? And he went, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Des. He's a brilliant guy as well. Uh, again, you know, one of those one of those blokes who just kind of, I haven't really got a bad word to say against him. He's really, really top bloke. He loved his golf as well. And uh, still... Yeah, still a, a really good laugh. Great lad. Um, I can't remember Des during his playing. I can't remember him kicking people very much. Was that no, because of his pace? But he didn't have to. That's exactly right. That that for me, <clears throat> if you're a defender that doesn't need to do that, and what, also what he didn't have to do, he didn't have, he never had to make last ditch tackles. Hmm. He never put himself in those positions where he had to kind of do a slide tackle at the end. I mean, he used to come off at the end of the game. His shorts weren't even dirty. Um, and he would just he would just put himself in all the right places and make it really difficult for for you to beat him so he was I spoke earlier on about about sometimes putting myself in positions on the pitch where I didn't want to come up against other players <laughs> and when I played against Nottingham Forest I tried to be in the areas of the pitch where Des wasn't just so that I could have a, a, a decent chance <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously Nottingham Forest and Sheffield Wednesday, but he went to Sampdoria. Yeah, he well. did. You think with yeah. all of his attributes, are you surprised that, that he wasn't a success there? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in Italy in that time, though, I don't think they were they were kind of having those kind of defenders. They they wanted the Martin Keown type of defenders in Italy at that point, not, not the Des Walkers. And I think that was probably why yeah, it maybe didn't go quite as well for him as you might have expected mm. big player for England though of the years as yeah, well wasn't really he really good player for England yeah, yeah. really good um, I, I mean I, I thought there were times actually when he got left out the England team where he was you know should have been should have been in it I think he should have actually he was one of those players that should have won more caps than he got Yeah, I was interested to, to read that he was a kid at Spurs Oh, was uh, he? Yeah, he was. Uh, and he, he was basically kicked out of the club because it had an argument with Bill Nicholson no over not getting his hair cut. And now that surprised me because just having seen him from afar, because I don't know Des at all, having seen him from afar, uh, he always strikes me as a very mild-mannered yeah. man, you know? So if, if wow. that is true... Then, then that surprised Blimey. me a little. And you Bill you could have played with him at the same Spurs side. I didn't. Re- yeah, that's true. Yeah, I didn't realise Des was that old to have known Bill Nicholson. <laughs> mm, I think so. Anyway, that's that was what the story was. He was just a young boy, sure, at the time. So yeah. it was only before. Wow. Yeah, that does surprise me. I didn't realise he was at Spurs. Yeah. Well, the, well, as I say, it was just as a kid. Yeah. You know, he had to go. And, boy, yeah. Yeah, had to go and and um, find his way with with other clubs. Interesting thing. How many goals did you score in your career? 209. 209. How many Des scored? Oh, I don't remember Des really scoring very much. Yeah, you're quite right. Not to remember him scoring very much. One? One is the no correct way. answer. Was it really? He scored one goal and it was against uh, Luton on New Year's Day in uh, 1992. Wow. One goal. Yeah. How many games was that? And that must have been like 400 games or something. More, more. It's over 700 games. He played over 700 games no professionally. Way. Yeah, and he scored one goal. But I guess that when you're a defender like him with his pace, when you're attacking, you've got set plays and so on and so forth, he'd be the man you'd leave back, wouldn't yeah. he? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember him really coming up for for too many set pieces and things. And uh, yeah, that wasn't, his, that wasn't his forte. He knew what his strengths were. Brilliant. That's it from this edition of football's greatest tis thanks once again for joining us and sharing with us your five toughest opponents next time on football's greatest do do you see any similarities between jude bellingham's game and and the way you used to play the game a little bit he's he's uh, i thought i was scoring a lot of goals but if you see his (laughs) his uh, uh, how many goals he scores now and also the way he scores goals is creating it's not just enter the box or joining the, the box and, and, and finish a, a cross or uh, yeah, an assist from someone. He's also creating himself. Remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow us on your favourite podcast platform. Football's Greatest is a Folding Pocket production with BBC Studios. <laughs>